Welcome to Action Cut and Everything in Between, episode number 11. Today I'm speaking with Lucinda Bruce. She is an Australian film producer with a background in acting, production and broadcast. She's produced shorts, music videos and several feature films that have completed the festival circuit and have been nominated for awards internationally. So without further ado, let's jump right in. Welcome to Action Cut and Everything in Between, a comprehensive guide to shooting a feature film all on your own. Okay, Lucinda, thanks for coming on the show and giving you time. I really appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me. That's all right. Um, so tell us a bit about yourself. How did you get into this producing role? Um, the, the short answer is I volunteered as a behind the scenes photographer, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, I volunteered on, on a short film in Vancouver and because uh, I moved to Vancouver in 2013, 14. And um, the very first short film that um, I was connected up with, they needed a behind the scenes photographer. So I said, uh, you know, I'd do it. Um, uh, they didn't have a producer as such either. The, the guy had written it and was starring in it and wanted to direct it and all that sort of stuff. Just a little short little indie film. And um, so I just sort of offered to do the BTS. And then he was like, um, can you help me with this? I was like, yeah, sure, I can, I can do that. And then, you know, then he get me to do something else and then he'd need help with something else and then about a couple of weeks before we actually went to film it he said you know you're practically a producer on this thing and I went okay <laughs> I have no idea what at the time what that even was really and he was just like yeah you know I want you, I want you to I, I want you know I want to give you that producer title and I was like oh awesome okay cool um what do I need to do and he goes you're you're already doing it <laughs> so I'm like cool so yeah, so I just sort of um, then ended up producing it and just got a whole bunch of, you know, cars and actors. We ended up having like 140 cast and crew. It was a 1940s period piece and it was just a massive undertaking for my first stint as a producer. It was it was an immense and it was very overwhelming, but it was amazing as well. I made some really good friends from that experience. Yeah, nice. And then how did it move on from there then and on to your next one? Right. Well, because that film was a, a fair whack of a gem, it actually um, got nominated for a, a Leo Award for Best Costume. And the Leo Awards in Canada and Brit British Columbia are a fairly important thing. And that led to me getting my first feature film, which was part of the, um, uh, it was part of a program in Canada to sort of promote six or seven films indie films chosen out of all of Canada to get made into feature films and funded. But the catch was you only had $10,000 to make it with. So basically I called on quite a few favors from the short film that I'd worked on and, you know, just sort of started building up my connections and my network. And, and um, that film then also got nominated for um, two Leo awards. And that's just sort of built on and upwards from there. And I got a lot of work out of that. So that was sort of what, uh, it was just that first short film that sort of kicked it into gear. And I never knew I wanted to be a producer and I, I never really wanted to be a producer. I didn't know what it was. And um, it was just, I just knew I wanted to be in film. So, you know, I, I loved it. it. It gives me the freedom to do so many different things and so many different aspects. It's just awesome. Yeah, cool. And so for those who don't know, what does a producer actually do? <laughs> Well, I still don't know the, the exact <laughs> answer to that question, <laughs> but um, basically it's like you're putting a jigsaw piece, uh, puzzle together and you're finding all the pieces and, you, and you're putting them into the right places and you're getting all the, the cast and the crew together. You're doing all the paperwork. You, there are various different positions for a producer to do as well. So not all jobs I'll do all of those things. You know, some jobs I'll, I'll just be a creative producer and I'll help with the story and, and develop the story with the writer. Other jobs I'll be... Um, purely you know handling post or purely just doing production or consulting or any any number of things where all of the, the duties would vary um, but you know you're still sort of at the end of the day you're, you're making sure that the film gets put together properly and you're making sure all those pieces fit and that you're not trying to force a square into a circle and you're really just you know doing what's best for the film really yeah cool and would you be responsible for sourcing the funding yeah, sometimes, again, it really depends on whether or not you are one of those producers that does that or not, and depending on the project, whether they need it or not. There are some projects where I've come on board that haven't needed that, and there are other projects that do, and it's very difficult to do. It's a very 
I think it's one of the hardest parts of filmmaking, you know, because you can get together with a bunch of friends and you can shoot a great little film on a weekend. But, you know, if you want to do it properly, there's so many more things to consider and you, and you need that money to do it properly. And it costs a lot of money and it's, it, you know, it's a high risk investment film. So there's not a lot of, uh, the money's out there, but it's just, you've got to convince people that your film is the, is the one that they want to invest in. And that's yeah. the hard part. So what makes somebody a good producer, would you say? What sort of kind of, if somebody's thinking about getting into the film industry and, you know, maybe they're not as creative or something like that, they don't know how to use a camera, maybe producing could be a role for them, but what would be kind of, you know, the good aspect of their personality or skills? Patience. Yeah. Patience, patience, patience. I think, um, in my opinion, it's patience. Uh, you need an abundance of it in this industry. Um, you're dealing with a lot of uh, people who, uh, you know, they, they sort of think you, as a producer, you get on board and then their film's going to get made within the next month or within the next week or within the next, you know, six months. But in reality, it's a, it's a slow burn and, and often films take quite an amount of time to to develop, to get funding for, to actually then produce and then do the post-production. You can look at upwards of two to five, you know, years. I mean, Dallas Buyers Club took 17 years to get made, you know, 17 years to get the funding. And it had producer after producer after producer attached. And each one of them, you know, it just, it's all about the right fit. And when it works, it works. And when it doesn't, it doesn't. You just got to, you know, it's, it's just how it is sometimes, unfortunately. But hopefully every single one of those producers contributed to the project in some way that helped it get to that final point. Yeah. Okay. But definitely patience is, you know, you have to have an abundance of it, patience and understanding. And uh, there's not many producers out there. I think, you know, I don't know a lot of them myself, um, but for me, yeah, it's definitely patience, the, you know, perseverance and you've got to have passion for the story you're trying to tell. Yeah, sure. Wouldn't it be kind of along the lines of maybe kind of event planners and things like that, people who, good with you know numbers strategies pulling all so many different aspects together making sure it all works in the one place because i'm terrible at that kind of thing so <laughs> it is like that i mean you know it's often likened to you know like project management or things like that you you know in building or in any any number of um industries you can liken it to a production manager or a project manager somebody who's basically watching over everything, bringing in all of the different aspects, hiring the right crew, um, organising the casting sessions. Ultimately, you know, there's so many different ways to structure it as well. So it's not necessarily one way is how it's done every single time. So there are times where the producer might help with casting and there are times when they won't. So, yeah, it's very similar to kind of putting all these pieces together and making sure everybody's doing their job um, and I've actually found that as much as I think anybody particularly could be a producer, if they've got that ability and that skill, I think it still helps to have an understanding of every single, uh, department on a film set and every single job on a film set, because it makes you far more aware of what each person has to do for their own job. And you can help them that way. You know, you can make sure that they're without micromanaging them. You can make sure that they're, you know, they're doing it right and they're enjoying it and they're happy and they're, and they're getting the work done. Yeah. Cool. Um, I noticed on your IMDb that you do acting as well. Do you act and produce at the same time or is that just too difficult? I like to think of myself as a little bit of a female Stan Lee <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> without the notoriety. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I do tend to like, I'll, I'll play an extra or I'll just, you know, fill a space in, in, on the set if it's needed. I, my background is acting and I came from acting, um, theater and, and different things and I love it. And, um, I actually went to Vancouver to be an actor and fell into the producing role. And, and that's why, uh, and that's just what I've done ever since. And I've never looked back and, but I love acting and I'm passionate about it and I love actors and I love working with actors and, uh, it's nice to sort of, be able to touch base with those you know those the roots of my passion and where I've sort of come from in my background to where I am now and to be able to enjoy that aspect of it still you know and, and put myself as an extra I don't need a line I just it's just fun to be on set and fun to be in front of the camera yeah definitely so if mm. someone's looking to find a producer they're you know they're ready to start putting their indie film together 
where would they even begin to look for a producer and, and what should they look for? I think um, someone who likes their story, genuinely loves the story. I mean, it, it, it's hard. It's such a hard thing. Most of the time, most of my contacts and people that I've worked with have come through referrals and people that I've already worked with and, and such. And, and um, it seems to be the way that it's happened just word of mouth. Um, I've never really advertised myself uh, too much. I've never really done that. But um, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of people out there that call themselves producers as well. And, you know, they're, they're budding producers or they've just started or they, you know, they're wanting to be a producer. So it, it is a lot to sort of consider. And there's a lot to, lot to sort of think about when you're approaching someone. But the best bet is to, to look at IMDb and, and see if they've done films that are similar uh, in the style and the genre that you're looking to do and see if they've had, you know, any success in that area. And basically, you know, do word of mouth, do your research, talk to people, get feedback from people that have worked with them, that kind of thing. If they're bigger producers, if you're doing an indie film and you're trying to get a bigger pro producer attached in order to get funding, you know, it is a lot more difficult to get past the gatekeepers to get to those sorts of people. But, you know, nothing's impossible. But um, I think it's just about finding the right producer that's going to really enjoy working on your kind of a film and your kind of story. Okay. These gatekeepers that you mentioned, who are they exactly? <laughs> Um, you never know who they are. They just, they stand in your way every time you try to get uh, an actor that's well known on board your film, every time you try to get funding or get to a big, uh, big distributor or a big production company, there's always people that, uh, uh, will talk to you before you reach anybody that, um, can really potentially help you. So, you know, the gatekeepers are there and they're there for a reason. And I, I know why they're there and I've experienced it myself in, terms of you know you occasionally start to feel like oh I really wish somebody was like screening some calls or, or you know you kind of start to feel like that'd be great if someone else was handling that for me so that I could focus on this so I understand why they're there and I think they're beneficial and they help it in a lot of ways but they are difficult to get through so you know for indie producers and indie storytellers and filmmakers and whatnot it's it's a difficult thing to bypass sometimes but they're out there and they'll they're there to protect people's interests and and you know people's um uh reputation and things like that so they're needed um it's just one of those things part of the industry so yeah, you know sure. they're great if, if they're on your side and they're a pain in the butt if they're not on your side yeah um and what's the difference between an executive producer and a producer or is that kind of a blurred line it can be blurred i mean there's so like again there's so many different things that associate producer co-producer producer executive producer i mean executive producers usually have brought the money in or they are the money one of the two usually tends to be the people that have, that have brought the money in and um they you know have a lot of interest and investment in the film um they may not do anything they may not be active at all in the film or they may be very hands-on. It's it, again, it's a very varied thing and it's up to the individual. Some people like to just go, here's my money, go and make the film. Others like to be like, how are you spending my money exactly? I'm going to come and watch you do that. <laughs> yeah, right. Or I'm going to come and help, you know, one of the, one of the three. So obviously everything in between. So um, again, there's no, I mean, there is a clear definition, but it's, it, it can get blurry and, you know, everything sort of bleeds into one another and then everybody does different jobs and, and sort of, you know, yeah, cross over all the time, crosses over all the time. Yeah, sure. So with your work, when people approach you with a new script or idea, um, are there any kind of genres, you know, are you looking for certain types of uh, movies to work on? You know, um, is there a I, bit of a repeat pattern happening? Because I had a look through your IMDb. You've got your filmography is is very impressive. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, it's definitely varied. I mean, I I like a good story. It doesn't bother me what genre it is. Obviously, some genres are easier to sell at the end of the day, like horror. 
whereas other genres are harder to sell, like drama, depending on, you know, who you're selling it to and, and whatnot. Um, so I tend to just go for story and people. They're the two reasons I make a decision to work on a film. If they've been referred by somebody or I've worked with them before on something else and, you know, they're, they're good people or they're, or they're, you know, really passionate about the film, that's a big thing for me. And the story's got to be good. Um, people more more important than the story, really, because you can change a story, whereas you can't change people so easily. Yeah, sure. Mm. So is it kind of a repeat? Um, do you work with a lot of the same filmmakers? Um, and are you just working in Australia or are you going overseas much? No, I work... Uh, so I head over to LA on Thursday and I'm there for seven weeks and I'm attending the American film market and I do network quite a bit while I'm there and there are quite a few projects that I've got in development that once hopefully I can get funding for um, will either film in, in LA or Canada is another film that I want to get off the ground that's shooting in the Czech Republic for instance um, one in uh, South Africa and Illinois another in Morocco and France and Italy there it's everywhere really and and the bonus is that these places are just so beautiful but um you know the, the tax credits help and location credits and things like that are starting to create uh, more opportunity to take film to, to onto location so i do tend to work um globally um i'd like to think of myself as that anyway but um you know I, i've shot some stuff in canada and i've shot some stuff in in america and um looking forward to shooting some things in europe and, and england and um yeah uh, I do try to keep it fluid and all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And with the American film market, are you heading over there to pitch anything or is it just purely a networking kind of event for you? It's, it's both. Like, I mean, the networking is invaluable, you know, uh, it's like eight days of 7,000 plus industry professionals. And these are not indie filmmakers, not all of them, you know, a uh, good number of them are, uh, Warner Brothers, Universal, NBC, Fox, you know, a lot of the big players are there as well as, you know, some of the smaller players and, and a lot of different distribution and sales agents companies. So it's a really good opportunity to network, but I am taking um, films with me. So I'll have two uh, completed films and I've got one uh, pilot shot for a TV show that um, I'll be taking with me. Not that AFM is really about film, uh, TV, but there is... There are a lot of TV executives there, so you never know. Um, but I'm also then taking packaged projects to pitch as well. Yeah, nice. So yeah. you might be slightly biased, but what would you say to someone who was thinking about shooting a feature film, indie film, and they didn't have a producer on board? I think the, the term producers used uh, in many different ways at the moment um, there's a lot of people who think they're a producer, but they're not. Um, there's a lot of people who have had to become a producer because they've had no option, but they might not know how to do it. Um, somebody who didn't have a producer on board, I would tell them that it would be good to have one because it saves them a lot of headaches, but it can also cause a lot of headaches. I mean, now you're having to work with someone who's, who's potentially telling you what to do and how to do it. You're, working with someone who's potentially wanting to change a story to make it sell better, potentially wanting to change who you've cast in the film or who's directing it, especially if you're wanting to direct it. Um, it just depends on the producer. I try to be more collaborative than directive. So uh, I tend to work with the people involved already and try to maintain the, the project the way that it is. But um, some projects you sort of, you kind of see that they won't go anywhere if, if they keep things the way that they are. So it's a difficult one because you, you, you should have a producer to help you uh, with all of the things that you don't want to do, the paperwork, contracts, deals, dealing with agents, you know, that's all the producer's job. Um, casting is something the director can focus on. Uh, and again, it depends on the sort of producer that you're getting involved. Are they creative producing and helping you with the story? that kind of thing. But I think, you know, having worked on different projects, um, projects, seeing what people have done without a producer though, some people are just natural at, at getting films put together and they're amazing at it. 
and they haven't needed a producer. They've just gone with, you know, the bare bones of what they have and they've just gotten it done. And sometimes that can work out really well for people, but you know, producers tend to have connections that a filmmaker won't. So, you know, and they tend to sort of, if they're putting their name to it, uh, they want it to be good. And the only reason that they'd be telling you to change things or cast somebody different is because they really feel strongly about making it the best possible project and best possible sort of film at the end of the day. Um, because it also reflects on them as a producer. Yeah, cool. For a producer that's just starting out, I'm not sure if this is kind of forbidden or what, but what's the case with maybe you want to get your name onto a couple of films with actually buying producer credits? Do you, do you hear of that much? Does oh, yeah, that, I mean, you know, it happens it, a lot. Yeah. yeah, it does. You know, like crowdfunding, you know, you, you sell producer credits with crowdfunding. Um, the notoriety that comes with, with buying a producer credit and getting VIP tickets to the red carpet event and meeting the cast, you know, without you having to do anything except give money, I think can be quite attractive to a lot of people. I don't think it's um, forbidden. I think it's a, if it works, which it's very hard to make crowdfunding work and I don't like to do it. Um, it's a lot of, lot of work and I don't think people realise just how much work it is to get a successful campaign together. I've run two successful campaigns um, uh, in, in, for film. Uh, I haven't run them, you know, I haven't been in charge of them, but I've helped run them. And they're a lot of work, a lot more work than I care to, to do to raise money um, for a film. And it requires between three to six months. So before you can even look at starting working on pre-production development uh, and getting the film made, it, it t chews up so much time, you know, just, just getting that sort of crowdfunding put together. Some people can do it really easily and they love it and all the more power to them. But it's just, uh, for me, it's not something I like to do. But um, that doesn't mean to say if someone came up and said, I'll give you 10 grand for a producer credit, that I would say no, depending on the film and the project and if the people involved were happy with that. But there are some cases where you say no to things like that. You say no to money because the, the demand in return is too high or it's just wrong or it's not something that you want to do. You know, they want to put their, their niece or their daughter in the film or they want to put someone that doesn't even know how to direct as a director. So it, it just depends. But I don't see anything wrong with that. If you, can, if you can hustle and make it happen for yourself, then why not, you know? Yeah, I suppose if it's right and it fits, it's, it's helping both parties, isn't it? It's helping to fund the film and helping to move that producer's career forward at the same time. So Yeah, yeah. A... you know, it's just making sure that, the films get if the film gets that sort of recognition then and gets some success from it or just some notoriety from it, it it helps tremendously but if it sort of falls on its face and it flops then it hasn't really done anybody any good mm. yeah um so do you travel around many of the film markets or is it just afm each year mainly afm because i i love afm as opposed to khan or any any number of the film festivals that have markets attached to them, mainly because um, AFM doesn't have a film festival and you're purely there for business purposes. And I love films and I love watching films. And I, lo I went to Cannes in 2017. It was a beautiful, amazing experience. I would love to go again. But for the pure business side of it, I feel like the film festivals kind of distract from the, the main focus of what you're actually trying to achieve at the market. So um you know you're more interested in walking the red carpet than than you know trying to get a business deal done and you're in Cannes so of course you want to go and walk the red carpet and, <laughs> you know who wouldn't so it's one of those things that uh for me I, I love that but at the same time AFM because it's just pure business and there's no distractions it's just it's it's awesome you know there's just everybody there is talking film people are there to do a deal people are there to buy films people are there to sell films that's the purpose of it. And, and that's what, that's why I'm there. So it's, it's just, it's great that in that sense. Yeah. Cool. Have you ever been to Berlin, the European film market? Yeah, what? I have actually. Um, it was interesting. I spent one day there. I drove from the Czech Republic to Germany, to Berlin for the day for, for the Berlinale and uh, went to the market. It's a very small market in comparison to, um, 
say, Khan or AFM. But it was a great, great little market, great atmosphere, great location. Um, I knew some people in, in Germany as well, which made the experience pretty like a lot of fun because I ended up sort of hanging out with friends and, and um, just talking business and talking films, which is always a fun experience at those sorts of things. But um, yeah, it was one day I, that that's the, my experience of Berlin Alley was just one day. So I'd love to go back and, and do it again and experience it in full and, and really enjoy the, the whole um, market and see what it's all about. Yeah. I'm thinking about heading there in February next year. Um, I was yeah. going to try and get to AFM this year again because I went last year, but um, my films just aren't ready. So yeah, won't make it to AFM this year, but yeah, going to aim for Berlin. I've never been to Berlin either, so I'm just keen to go and explore it as, as a city as well. Yeah, that's, I did spend half the day exploring Berlin because I'd never been before and I'd always wanted to go. My mum actually went there um, just uh, before the wall came down back, you know, back oh, yeah. in, quite a few years ago now. So it was um, interesting to sort of stand in the same place where mum had stood and had a photo of the wall and I stood in the same place and the wall was torn down, you know, it's yeah. just it was pretty epic. So, you know, and I, and I learned German in school and learned about the history of Germany in school. So it was really cool to just finally go and see a, a very small part of the country and, and get to use, uh, I was hoping to use my, my German skills, but uh, everybody spoke English. <laughs> okay. so. Oh, well, maybe, maybe next year. Maybe next year. I, I do plan on going to Cannes again next year. Um, which would be great. So, um, so, and I've, I've made a few friends over there. I love France. I've been to France quite a few times. Um, so very fortunate in that sense. And, um, it's a beautiful market. It's a beautiful experience. It's a lot of fun, but it's huge. It's massive, you know, yeah. it's just spread out and, uh, you know, you're trying to get from one meeting to the next and you're having to walk 15, 20 minutes between meetings. So you can't fit in as much as you would like throughout the day. So it's it's an interesting experience, but I loved it, and I'd love to go back again. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Maybe they need some of those electric scooters, like they've got in LA. <laughs> we were zipping around on those. <laughs> yeah, for They're sure. Good fun. Absolutely. Um, so, are you working on? Are you in the middle of any projects at the moment? And kind of what's what's next for you? Yeah, I've got um, quite a few projects on the go uh, at the moment. Um, quite a few in development. Uh, you know, you always should have. A number of projects in development because you just never know what's going to you know what's going to sort of stick and what's going to take off um so i have a variety of projects in different genres but i only have a very sort of core select a uh, few films that I, I actually sort of actively pitch at the market so you know a good probably usually between five to ten films packaged you, you should have at least one completed film with you, but if you don't, it doesn't matter. Like it's, it's an experience in itself going to AFM, but to get through, to sort of really make the most out of it, having a completed film helps, helps quite a bit, helps you get a lot more meetings. Um, but it's, yeah, I mean, it's sort of, um, I have quite a few, I've got two completed and I've got about, crikey, <laughs> quite a few, quite a few packaged. Um, and I'm just basically setting up a whole bunch of meetings um, as much as I can and, and trying to meet, you know, all sorts of different people um, while I'm there. And, and, you know, you know, you've got to have a variety of films because not every investor is interested in a horror. Not every investor is interested in a sci-fi or in a drama. So that's why I take just a variety so that, you know, and so that I, you know, I have something potentially that they may be interested in. Yeah. And are you going over with any of the um, other crew or, you know, the directors that were involved in any of these projects? Um, I did that last year and, you know, it's much easier for me as a producer. I think it just might be me or a personal thing, but I tend to prefer to go alone um just because you can cover more ground than you can do with two or three or four directors from different projects hanging off you and they all expect you to talk about their project first in the room yeah. um when it may not be that kind of a room so they you know the the experience that i've had now has sort of taught me that um being able to sort of produce uh, 
pitch different projects and the freedom to do that means not having any of the filmmakers with me basically but it's a great experience for them so I you know I took you know, I take them over so that they have that first experience and what of what AFM is like. I think it's important for them to understand um, the business side of it just as much. I mean, a lot of a lot of them don't have to produce, but they should understand what this industry is about and what sort of films. You know, there's that creative and expressive side of being a director or a writer, but at the end of the day, there's the business side of it. And you've got to think about that just as much as you have to think about the creative. And that's technically what a producer does. You know, it, it's sort of, they look at the creative and they go, that's not going to sell. But if you do this and this and this, it will sell. And the creative's going, but that's my baby. And you're going, I know it's your baby, but if you want to sell your baby, you've got to change it a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so it is difficult. Um, I, I do take filmmakers over and I am I have got colleagues coming with me this year as well but they've been before it's not their first rodeo so they they don't need me holding their hand as such so it's um it should be a good experience and um I mean you know every time you go you learn something new I'm always learning there's so many things about being a producer that I still don't know and um you know you just you've just got to be prepared to to learn as much as you possibly can in those sorts of situations yeah cool I suppose that mm. compare it to it's probably a good idea to go on your own. Um, I went skiing once down to the snow there from Sydney and I just went on my own one time and like I got so much more skiing done. I met so many more new people that gave me tips about, you know, the resort and where to go and off piste. And, you know, it's, it's a similar thing at, at AFM, isn't it? I suppose. It is. It's, and it's like traveling alone. You, you meet more people, you learn more, you do more adventurous things than you would do when you've got to plan something with someone else. So, you know, for me, it's much easier for me to have one meeting that covers seven films than to have three meetings for three different films with the same person with three different filmmakers. Yeah. It just doesn't make logical sense. It just, it's not, it's not logical in any way, shape or form. So um, especially when they're sitting down expecting to hear you pitch solely about their film, um, but then that person might go, well, yeah, that's not really up our alley. Have you got anything else? And I've got to sit there and then pitch someone else's film in front of the filmmaker. It doesn't make them feel very good, but that's what I have to do. So I, I do prefer to be in there on my own. Um, can, you know, you can bust out several meetings in a day when you're just on your own time yeah. and you're doing your thing. So as much as I love company and I love, you know, we, being with the filmmakers and, talking film with them and, and such it's just when you're in that business mode that's what it needs to be about it can't be about the creative you know it needs to be about because ultimately if you sell their film you're helping them and if you can't do that while they're there then you're not helping them you know so for me yeah I think it's uh, one of those things that you know but that's just me other producers might be able to have 10 filmmakers with them and, and still sell every film you know it's just a preferential thing to me personally yeah nice when you say your your films aren't uh, ready, what do you mean? I'm trying to get them to a decent screener level, so they're all shot, but there's there's still a lot of post to do, and the sound needs doing. So I just really want to get them pretty polished. Um, like, what, what sort of condition do you take yours uh, in if if they're kind of if they're shot? I tend to at least like having a trailer cut, mm. um, knowing that there's a screener on the way it's not a bad place to be in for yourself really um if you put a if you put a trailer together then it's sort of you're giving them a taste of it and then you know because it, they're not going to watch the film at afm anyway they don't yeah, have yeah. time mm. so you know a lot of people I, I sort of tend to be like i tell a lot of my filmmakers i want the film ready for afm but i know that it's not going to go to them until two or three weeks afterwards and they're not going to watch it until two or three yeah. weeks after so having a beautifully cut, finely, you know, finite sort of trailer to me is more important than having the completed, you know, perfect picture, perfect uh, screener. Yeah. See, I went with trailers last year and I felt that a lot of my meetings just kind of got to a dead end because they were like, yeah, the trailer looks great. Um, we can't really say much more until we see the screener. And that was kind mm. of where I got to and that's where I've been kind of ever since finishing off the films and yeah and because I'm doing everything myself it's uh, 
taken a long time to finish and yeah. I, stupidly I shot them back to back as well so I've got like two whole feature films that I'm just trying to <laughs> that's actually up. not a bad way to do it I've suggested that to other filmmakers before when they've got a couple of projects and they've got funding for one but not the other I say well you're going to have the crew you're going to have the 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 cast and the time just shoot them back to back you know and, and get it done and use the funding for both and you know there's so many sort of different tricks and ways of doing it so it sort of it can it can make it a bit easier but then yeah you've got twice as much footage to edit but the fact that you're doing it all yourself I mean that's a big job you know it's a lot of work yeah and it's, it's I think it's the overwhelm as well and then procrastination kicks in um and then I'm also trying to set myself up here in the UK as well so a big move overseas isn't easy um no it's not no. But you're, then, you're yeah. from there originally? <clears throat> yeah, so I'm from, from here originally. I lived in Australia for like nine years. So I just felt like it was time for a change, come back home, try and put mm. down some roots and um, yeah, get the films finished off and then hopefully shoot a new one in, in the UK. Um, yeah, well, there's yeah. some good tax credits there. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, if you go to BFI or any of the um the UK like the UK lottery fund and things like that they film a lot of funds out of that so it's definitely worth um you know using it but you could potentially um if you've got a company there and you've got a company here in Australia because you've been here for nine years so you're you'd be um permanent yeah permanent yeah, resident yeah yeah citizenship yeah. yeah yeah citizenship so you could have a company in both and, and works the, work the co-production and the tax credits with each other essentially so it it make the it make it a lot easier to get your film made using tax credits and not having to meet the Quape standards for Australia or UK film standards for you know shooting in the UK and having it to be purely an Australian story or purely a UK story. Um, it can sort of the lines are a bit more blurred blurred when you do a co production. It just reduces the the need to meet certain criteria, which makes it a little bit easier to get funding. Um, and such but that's what a lot of i mean i'm doing a co-production potentially through the uk to south africa um to, and france because i don't think australia and france have a co-production deal in place or something like that one of the maybe we do but it's another country that doesn't but france has a co-production with that country so i can have a co-production with france and they can have a co-production with that country and essentially then it's a three-way co-production and we can all use the tax credits in all three countries to help fund the film basically right. Mm. So, maybe i'll have to get to in touch about. with you for my uh for my next film i'm looking yeah. for a producer <laughs> <laughs> well there you go if you've been doing everything yourself look like i said it can be easy it can be difficult you know you, you don't i mean i i help out with a bunch of projects and then you know 12 months into it the the filmmaker's just like uh oh, this isn't really working and you've you've spent as a producer you've spent a year helping them with their project and they're just like this isn't happening as fast as I would like, or it's not going in the direction I want. And then all of a sudden a year's work is, you know, mm. gone. And if I'm collaborating and I'm helping, then I'm usually not getting paid to do it. So it's, it's an interesting sort of dynamic sometimes, but yeah. um, uh, it just depends, you know, there's so many different um, styles and ways of doing it. And it's just a, a matter of making sure that you work well with the person and, and paperwork. I learned that one last couple of years. Paperwork's got to be in place and, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a cutthroat business sometimes. If you don't have paperwork in place, people will quite quickly screw you over if they feel that, you know, mm. there's, a, there's a better producer over there that all of a sudden you've gotten the project to the point where they can approach that better producer and they don't need you anymore. And that literally just happened to me three months ago. I got it to a certain point and I got the project ready to go and they were just like, yeah, but this producer's bigger and they can get it further. So I'm going to go with them. I was like, all right, wow. <laughs> cool, good luck. <laughs> and just wish them all the best. What can you do, right? Um, but it's just one of those things, just one of those things that you can't really control. And, you know, that's why I say patience is the biggest thing, but a lot of filmmakers don't have as much patience as, as they probably should um, or could. And it makes it difficult sometimes, but... You know, at the end of the day, I mean, I, I just want to be on set all the time, but it's not how it works, unfortunately. Yeah. You know, I've got a, there's a lot of work to do before, um, during and after that, before you can even sort of 
really get to that point. So it's, um, it's interesting. I love it. I love it. I, you know, I'm addicted to it. You know, it's sort of, it's my happy drug being on set and making films and keeps me going. And um, yeah, it's just, I love it. <laughs> I don't want to do anything else with my life. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So, yeah. It's great. Same. Whereabouts in um, the UK are you again? <clears throat> I'm up in Manchester. That's right. I've got family up that way. Oh, have you? Yeah, my dad's from my dad's from Sheffield originally. So, okay. So I've got UK citizenship. Yeah, nice. And um, I've often thought about going to the UK and doing some work over there because there's quite a bit of work there. Yeah. Um, and the UK film industry, I mean, the UK film industry is phenomenal really in some of the content that they're creating. So yeah a great place to sort of be in the industry whereas here it's mm. a very um very difficult industry to really kind of be successful in and yeah Paul poppy syndrome is rife here and it's very hard to really um get anywhere whereas you go to LA this is why I love going to LA because you sort of get there and it's people are, are more than happy to help lift each other up and and get stuff done you know yeah roll their sleeves up and I mean, the Australian film industry is great. Don't get me wrong. I, I love it. I appreciate it and, and whatnot, but it is very difficult for an indie filmmaker to, to get anywhere in it because they're, you know, they're just sort of supporting the known mm. elements of the industry and, and the unknown elements don't get a look in often. Yeah, sure. Mm. Mm. So I can understand why you moved back. <laughs> yeah. I am loving it so far. It's good. Apart from, apart from the weather, we've had like three weeks of just drizzly rain um yeah well we had a good summer good is summer so um oh, the yeah. summer's in the uk are beautiful I yeah love the summer in the uk love I, it i think for my next I'm actually film gonna be... yeah yeah sorry. i was just gonna say no, for my just... next film i'll just write like um rain into the script i'll be like it was a rainy day <laughs> and i'll be like yes raining <laughs> again <laughs> exactly i'm actually gonna be back there in um june for this oh, yeah. um film festival which should be a bit of fun which which so... festival is that the World Cinema Film Festival. That's oh, there yeah, the one where you're the, the judge. Yeah, cool. Yeah, judging it. So I'll be back over in my, yeah, in the UK. I love, I love London and I love the UK. Like, yeah. you know, it's awesome. I only visited there for the first time in like 2012. So, okay. um, but I love it. And yeah, I'm looking forward to being back there next year or being well. So, yeah, um, I'll be around and uh, I plan on staying for, for a while. I think a few weeks, maybe. Yeah. If I can. Cause I got a lot of family there to catch up with and a lot of friends and yeah, a lot of people that I've known, you know, that I know that live there. So yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. So I'm really sort of looking forward to that. Yeah. Well, I might get in touch when my next film is um, up and up and running, get these two out the way. Um, yeah. Apparently at, at Berlin, they like uh, an Aussie genre film. So um, we'll see how they go then. Hopefully the screeners will be fully ready by then. And Yeah. Yeah. Know. Mm. it's definitely a goal for you i mean something to look forward to and berlinale is a great market you know i'm like i said i've only spent a day there half a day really but it was it was a great half a day and um it's, it's a beautiful city and you know great atmosphere yeah. so yeah no i liked it yeah cool liked it quite a bit so yeah yeah, yeah. Like any, let me know um yeah for sure yeah, so I might give I, I might give Khan a go one year as well, but I just at the moment I can't. Um, I don't know. I just can't imagine myself being there. I just feel like being an indie filmmaker and being there. I don't know. It just seems a bit more elite and fancy tuxedos. It is very and... yeah. It is very elite. I think that's one of the reasons why I I don't like it as much as as say the AFM or Berlinale because it does have that kind of side to it. But at the same time, I mean, there are some great things there. So if you do the producers round table and things like that, you get it to, you get introduced to, you know, um, some really, you know, prominent people and you get to talk to them for a minute or two and, and it's great. Um, there's a lot of people there and it is one of the big, I mean, it is the biggest market and festival, you know, yeah. in the film industry. So, I mean, I think a lot of people are saying that other festivals are getting bigger, which may be true. Um, but it's certainly the biggest one I've I've experienced, and it does sort of come across that way. I mean, I was turned away from the red carpet because I wasn't wearing a dress, okay. out loud, which I was very uh, annoyed about. But at the end of the day, I still had a good night and met up yeah. with some 
and like people that I didn't really know and it was just great because I had a great night but um it's it's an experience mm. to have you know I mean I plan on being there because it's my 40th next year and a friend sort of offered me um her husband's boat to have my 40th on which is kind of cool <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, hey, why not? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but not sure if I'll not sure if I'll get there, but um that's the plan. We're sort of putting it together. So that's May. Yeah. So there's plenty of time. But uh, you know, I usually tend to focus on AFM first and then see how I go with um with Khan. But um, you know, it's always an excuse. I mean, I may do it because if I'm coming over to the film festival in June anyway, it sort of would roll into yeah. one another. So if yeah, I came cool. over in May. Yeah. Flew over in May and then just stuck around for a month or two then you know it would work out pretty well so yeah yeah awesome yeah it goes all right well i might get to see you next year then yeah for sure that'd yeah. be fun sounds good. Be good hopefully you'll have your films sold yeah <laughs> that'd be nice otherwise it's just yeah. a very expensive hobby it is a very expensive hobby but hopefully hopefully you can get them sold and you'll be right it's not yeah. easy though you know it's not yeah. easy and yeah. And it's not like you get this big wad of cash, um, you know, when they when you do sell your film, it's usually mm. a contract over three or five or seven years and they they guarantee you a certain minimum. So you know that it's going to come in over that time. It's not going to be one big lump sum, unfortunately. But um, Yeah, it, it seems difficult at the moment as well. Like I was listening to a podcast with Alex Ferrari and he was like, you know, have you heard of this distributor that's gone under now? Um, mm. and just like, you know, the d distributors don't really know which way to go. It's, we're in such like a, um, a, a like a limbo, I suppose. And yeah, yeah, just nobody knows which way the industry is heading and how to make. They make don't. The stuff. funny thing is though, that in some parts of the world, cinema numbers are growing and screen and screen attendance, and cinema attendance is growing, you know, and mm. in, in some countries it's, it's still booming and it's big, you know, and, it, and it's just a matter of getting into those markets. I mean, China is, is one of them. It's massive you know they've got i think 30 something thousand screens which is i think some of the the biggest numbers of screens in the world australia only has four and a half thousand you know mm. but if you can get your film seen on 400 of, of those screens worldwide there's like 170 thousand yeah. that's a lot of screens you know yeah um and if you can get your film shown on 400 of them with max attendance you know you know you're going to cover the cost of your film if it's a fairly low budget but that's hard to do because you know a lot of distributors aren't sure of where that where it's all going um and it's hard to predict but i don't it's like you know things always come back and there's a resurgence of things you know retro is always cool again 30 years later or 20 years later so drive-ins are still you know a, a fun sort of retro thing and, and it's sort of seen as a bit of a as a fun thing these days you know they're still around and people thought that they'd disappear you know, when you got yeah. home theatres. Um, I think it's more the the medium that advances and changes and and dies out. VHS tapes, DVDs, CDs, CDs, that kind of thing. But I think cinema screens and and you know going out and, and things like that will remain. But um, I don't think that's going to change. It's just the problem with with cinemas is they're too expensive. Yeah, in my opinion, if they reduce the the cost of a ticket, the the it would just boom again. I mean, Tuesdays at, in most places in the world when there's a half price ticket night, it's packed. Yeah, and you know I just don't understand the common sense behind that. I know bills go up, rates go up, wages go up, but at the end of the day, if you're selling twice the amount of tickets, you're covering your cost still. Yeah, sure. You know, but um, it's uh, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, yeah. we will see. I'm not an expert on it, though. <laughs> That's <laughs> so all right. <laughs> no, just <laughs> but, your your opinion is enough. It's good, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So um, hopefully, though, it'll it'll stay there. And I mean, you're still selling films territory by territory. It's still a thing. Don't know if it always will be, but um, you know, I think it's it's still viable at this point yeah. in time. So. And what about kind of all, all the Netflix and things like this subscription on video on demand? And I think it'll only grow really, but at the same time, 
there's something to be said about going out with friends to a film screening. Horror films, for instance, lo people love going out to cinemas to watch that sort of stuff on their dates. And it seems very old fashioned, but it's still a thing. And a lot of young people are going to, to cinemas. And I think, you know, until we see like even possibly my generation die out, I think you're still going to have theatre attendance and, and people going out to the cinema and out for a meal and, and enjoying that experience. And I don't see it disappearing um, just because of streaming uh, giants. And I mean, the streaming giants, they've got to find a way of covering their costs still and, and they can only grow as they, you know, they can only fund things as they get bigger. Um, I've heard that Netflix is in debt tremendously at the moment. So, you know, does that mean they're going to struggle? Is that true? Who knows? Um, but uh, Amazon, like it's all growing. So there's there's so many streaming companies that are coming out now, and I think they're all going to be in, in high competition with one another. Um, but I I feel like there's an oversaturation of content in a lot of ways. I feel like with YouTube and Vimeo and and every man and his dog doing a, a YouTube video. Um, I think it's sort of interesting in some ways, but I think it's oversaturation. I think people sort of will get to the point where they might not want that so much, you know, it, I don't know. But in one of the films that I'm doing, it's a set in the future and, and every sort of surface is, is a screen and, a, and an advertising space. So, mm. you know, who knows what it's going to be like. But I think for now, I think while it is very difficult to sell a film in this market, um, obviously it's easy to sell certain genres like horror, but I still think it's not impossible. And I think it's... Um, Definitely something that um, will still go on, I think, for quite some time. But like I said, and that, that area isn't really my expertise. But, you know, um, I'd like to think that because numbers are growing in other parts of the world, you know, a lot more people are attending cinemas and theatres in other parts of the world, um, especially third, third world sort of countries and, and European and places like that where you know, it's becoming more of a thing and, and, you know, it hasn't been for quite some time, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think it's still going to be something that's, that'll be around for quite some time. And Netflix, I mean, I don't know how many subscribers they have to date. I'd be guessing anywhere between 170 million to 200 million. I mean, that's out of seven and a half billion people mm. and seven and a half billion people. I'm sure half of them would still go to the cinema or a quarter of, the, of them would still go to the cinema. You know, so to think that streaming is going to replace cinema, I think any time within the next few years, I don't see that happening just because it's not widely available to everybody in the world yet, you know? Yeah. So, and these streaming channels as well, they're, they're going to be getting more expensive soon with Disney Plus coming in and Apple Plus, whatever that's called. You know, suddenly mm -hmm. we're going to have to be paying, I don't know, 35 that's right. Dollars or whatever a month for all these streaming things. It's like, oh, cheaper to just go to the cinema. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is almost, you know, sometimes because you, when you get onto something like Netflix and you watch all the good shows there are to watch and suddenly you realise you, you're paying 10 bucks a month for 75% of the content that you'd never watch anyway. Mm. You know, and it, again, it depends on the country. See, here in Australia, um, we have free to air television. We don't need to pay for our free to air, like for our television to watch a lot of shows and things like that. It's all done through advertising and, and such. Whereas in America, you have to pay for all your cable TV channels. You have to pay to see, you know, your, your regular TV shows. And there's like hundreds of channels and it's just mind boggling how, um, how much content there is out there really in terms of that. But um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's 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 an over, it's it's sort of interesting to think about and discuss that's for sure um you know where the industry is going and how it's going to sort of evolve i think a lot of people are kind of um trying to guess that and see where it's ending i mean a lot of people think we're going to go down the virtual reality sort of route and um you know ready like ready player one for instance you know you, you live your life in a virtual world rather than in the real world um mm you know, eventually we're all going to be in the matrix and playing out our lives inside the matrix and things like that. You know, it's just, yeah. it's, it's incredible to think really what the future holds. But um, I think for now, 
I don't see, for me personally, I don't see cinemas disappearing really yeah. in general. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, theatre has been around for thousands of years. It's never died. It didn't die out when cinema came in or when moving pictures came in and everybody thought it would. Mm. Everybody thought nobody would go to the theatres, nobody would go to live shows anymore. And it is just as popular as it is as it was, you know, 500 yeah, years yeah. ago. So if theatre can survive the modern technology and, and such, then I don't see why, you know, cinema and things like that wouldn't. But, you know, it's different to a live play. There's something about watching a live play and, and the challenge of for an actor, especially you know, doing a live play. So I think that, that'll always be around. Um, and the cinema is just an extension of that, you know. So yeah, cool. I would hope that they, they'll be around for a while. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting because I had Mike Garrick on the show. He directed a film called Yesterday's Girl. And he said that the theatrical distribution model is pretty much dead for kind of indie indie filmmakers so it's kind of good to you know get your take on that yeah i think a, a lot of do, people do feel that way um but if it was there wouldn't be i mean perhaps theatrically it's harder for sure i wouldn't doubt that for a second it is definitely harder um sometimes i feel like i became a producer 10 years later than i should have done because 10, 15, 20 years ago, um, the model was good and strong and, and, and working and it doesn't work so much now. But I don't think that means that it's dead. I think it just means it's in the middle of evolving and we're all just trying to figure out where we all fit into it. And once it has finished that evolution, I think it'll still be there. Um, but it'll just be different and people adapt like we always do. You know, the film industry always adapts. But, I mean, the film industry is relatively young compared to so many other industries and so many other uh, things. I mean, it's only been around for 130 years, 140 years, roughly. I mean, if you count sort of the very first feature films being made in the late 1800s, it's, um, it's a relatively young industry. So, you know, we've got a lot of learning and a lot of growing to it. It's grown so much quicker and so much faster than... The theater, and then the theater has, for instance. So theater has been around for a long time, and I think it will be forever. But um, I think it's just a matter of figuring out where everything fits in. The model that worked only worked for thirty or forty years. You know, that model only came about in the sixties, seventies, or something like that. I think Metro Goldwyn Mayer when they formed and moved over to LA, and and then LA became the mecca. And there's, I mean, there's a lot of history there. You know, I think that happened in the thirties or forties or something. And there's a lot of history there, but it's happened in a very short amount of time. So I feel like, you know, predicting certain things, it's difficult because you just, it's such an evolving industry and it's a very young industry. And now with so much content being made, it has to go somewhere, you know, it has to be somewhere. Um, but it could crash in on itself. You know, the, the saturation of content could create an overabundance and a, and a lack of interest. In it, mm. you know and people will switch off streaming channels because there's just too much crap on there because everybody's getting their stuff part of me everyone's getting their stuff thrown onto uh streaming stuff you know so you can put your own films on on amazon prime you don't need to get a distribution you can just sell mm. on there but um i think you know it's it's it, i'd like to think that the the theatrical model of the film industry would survive in some way um it just it has to change it has to adjust it has to evolve in order to survive like anybody and anything does. So I think that's what we're in the middle of right now is this transition and this um, figuring out of, of how it's going to work and, and, you know, how it all fits into the big picture, really. So it is a difficult time. It's not easy and it's harder to get funding for films. And, but the money's out there. The problem with film is that it's a high-risk investment, but the tax credits are sort of reducing that. So with tax credits, you know, you can you know, guarantee 30, 40, 50, 60% of someone's money back. So, you know, that's why a lot of films and a lot of projects are now sort of going through the tax credit route. And a lot of countries and a lot of states and places are, are creating these tax credits because it's drawing a lot of that money here. So um, I think it's just, it's just got to find its place. I think it's just got to go through this sort of evolution and see where we end up with it and just keep pushing through it. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you want to make a film, you go and make a film, you know. 
if you're just making the film to, to, to be creative for people to see and you're not worried about building a fortune from it, um, you know, it's, it's, it can be very rewarding. It can be enjoyable, but um, if you're trying to make a living off it, it can be hard work and it can be very long sort of time and long amount of time that you have to commit to it um, where you don't see any return, especially as a producer. Um, you know, you, you commit to a film and, more often than not, I'm taking a percentage of back end. And if the film doesn't sell and doesn't do well, and I've worked three years on it without pay and it doesn't do well, I'm not going to see a single cent. So, yeah. you know, it, it is a very difficult sort of, you know, industry. You need to be able to survive and you need to be able to sort of thrive off of very little, which is, you know, what I've learned to do and um, make the most of it. But from what I can tell and from some of the, the meetings and, and such that I'm having, you know, when I go to AFM, there, there's still a huge amount of interest in, in good solid content. So I think if you've got something great and amazing, I think it'll get out there and it will get seen, you know, but um, it is figuring out the business model side of it. that's difficult. And whether or not there's money to be made is, is always a difficult one, but um you can only do your best. So, you know, that's all I ever try to do is my best. And I try to learn as much as I can every day. And every time I do a film or every time I have a falling out with a filmmaker, you know, I hope to learn something from it and, and be better and do things differently and, and, um, you know, try to make the most out of, you know, my passion for what I do. Um, and, and hope that, you know, the industry will, in some way reward that passion, you know, for all the filmmakers that are passionate about their film, I would hope in some way that that gets rewarded. Um, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's I, great. I, could, I could talk all night about film. <laughs> 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 no, there's a lot. I mean, yeah, there's just so much, you know, I try to download a lot of my brain into filmmakers, but it's very difficult. Like I've had a lot of people say, cause I've got so much work on there. Like, Oh, you should have an assistant or you should have a, some, or you should have a gatekeeper. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that would be great. But it's like, I've got to download my consciousness into theirs because yeah. they need to have the same passion. They need to have the same outlook. They need to have the same amount of patience and perseverance that I do. And if they don't have that, it's very hard to teach patience. You know, people mm. struggle with it. It's one of the biggest, um, because the generation now is, is a, a generation of instant gratification. They open their phone, they've got information 24 seven. Whereas I come from a generation that's on the cusp of that. Whereas the first five to six years of my life, I didn't know what a computer was, but then we got one. And then mm. of course the information on it though was very limited. So I'd have to get an encyclopedia disc and put that in and look up the encyclopedia on mm. the computer. And then the internet, you know, came in, but even then it was, just words there wasn't all this fancy stuff you know it wasn't graphically designed beautifully it was just information so you know i've come from a time where you couldn't get that instant gratification so you had to have the patience yeah. to get the information that you needed so you know you had to learn it um whereas a lot of the generation now a lot of the younger filmmakers coming up think you know uh, they're just they just open their phone and they've got everything that they need at their fingertips so mm. there's they, they you know not that they're ungrateful in any way or not that they don't have patience. There's a lot of young filmmakers, filmmakers I've met that are great, you know, and do have that patience. But um, I'm working with one at the moment, you know, who's just astounding. He's so passionate and he's so um, focused and he's so just eager and he never lets that sort of go away. Even though, you know, we've been working on the film now together for a couple of years, trying to get certain people attached and trying to get it to the point where it's, solid and it's taken time and it doesn't seem to matter he just keeps on pushing and he keeps connecting with me and he keeps writing to me and he keeps sort of just asking the questions and going yep cool awesome just keeps pushing and keeps going persevering yeah. so for me that's a, a an amazing trait for a young filmmaker to have um, and not a lot of them have it so um you know he he's very keen to do things properly and and it's always great to meet people like that and work with people like that um, because they, they understand it then. But, you know, you work with a few people who just, after a year of working with them, they don't understand why it's still taking so long. Mm. But that's just the way it is sometimes. So, 
Yeah. It, um, so you can't teach that. You can't, people find it. Uh, I mean, maybe you can. I don't have the ability, I think, to teach patience to people because I've already got abundance of it for myself in terms of the film. <laughs> That's where all my patience is. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's fun. I love film. I love talking about it. I love making it. Um, I love being on set. So, yeah, it's good. Yeah, I'm missing it a lot. Can't wait to get back mm. into it. Um, I know, right? Yeah. It's like you've got months and months of pre and then just this short little time on set and then months and months of post. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and you know it's like so, you become a like a little family with the cast and crew don't you and then suddenly you're not seeing that family anymore and that's um, right yeah it's you know it's it's, it it's interesting be hard. An instant family and then an instant separation of that family yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> and you might not see them again for months or years you know but you still for me just being connected with them through social media is good because you can always reach out to them and say hey i've got another film coming up yeah. But usually nine times out of 10, they've gotten to the point in their careers where they're either, you know, they're doing really well and they don't want to work on little indie films anymore, which is absolutely fine and understandable. Um, and that's, I think that's the biggest difference between a crew and, and a producer. Uh, you know, uh, a producer can spend several years trying to get an indie project off the ground. Um, and in that time, you know, a lot of the crew that they worked with on, you know, one film have gone up and up and up and, you know, working and, and making some good money in the film industry as crew. And you're still sitting here as a producer going, I'm just going to get funding. I'm just going to get funding <laughs> and then I'll get paid. It's great, you know. So it, it can be difficult. So, yeah, you do need to have a lot of understanding and patience and um, passion to really get the film made. And it's hard to sort of convince people sometimes that, you, that that's what you have and that's what's got to be done, you know. But at the end of the day, hopefully you get a film made and it looks amazing and everyone's happy or, you know, close, close enough to it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Listen, this has been awesome. Like I've learned so much and um, I really appreciate you giving your time and telling me no, about no, your, no. your story and your journey. Mm, no, thank you. That no, was great fun. No, it was awesome. Yeah. Enjoyed nice. It. Well, good luck at AFM. Um, when do you say you leave? It's soon. Isn't it? I actually leave Thursday cause I'm going a bit earlier for, um, uh, to help consult on a couple of things over there so and just sort of network and have meetings and, and things like that yeah nice well best of luck at AFM and um, maybe I'll get to see you at Berlin who knows who knows <laughs> alright thanks so much Lucinda thank you no thank worries. you bye one. cheers bye well, there you have it. Some absolute gold nuggets in there, whether you are a producer or you're looking to bring a producer on board for your next feature project. Thanks so much for listening. Hit that subscribe button and leave us a review. And thanks for supporting Indie Film. I've been Gareth Carr. This has been Action Cut and Everything In Between. And I'll see you at the next podcast. Action Cut and Everything In Between. A comprehensive guide to shooting a feature film all on your own. <laughs>